Hello, this is Anaya. This will be the first in a series of videos in which I will defend the Apocrypha and other pseudepigraphal books. I will point out the flaws of the Protestant Bible canon and will demonstrate the superiority of Apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books. In this first video, I will be defending the Apocrypha against the claim that these books are not scripture because they were not originally written in Hebrew. Let me start off by asking you this question. Does it matter whether or not a book was written in Hebrew? Why should this be the criteria for whether or not a book is considered scripture? Now, I'm not necessarily against the idea of it needing to have originally been written in Hebrew, but let's carry the Protestants' argument to its logical conclusion. The majority of people believe the New Testament was written originally in Greek. Now, if you believe that, you have to ask yourself, if it was originally written in Greek, and it is considered scripture, doesn't that automatically defeat your argument that the Apocrypha cannot be considered scripture because it is not written in Hebrew? Now, if you are willing to accept a different belief, one that I actually hold to, you would actually believe that the New Testament was not originally written in Greek, and that it was actually originally written in either Aramaic or Hebrew. Many people will not be willing to change their perspective on that, and will still maintain the New Testament was originally written in Greek, but that right there demolishes this particular argument. But I will go further just to show you how weak this argument really is. Back in the 20th century, some ancient religious writings were discovered. These were known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, right away we see this claim crumble, for they found the Apocryphal Wisdom of Sirach, the Apocryphal Book of Tobit, in the apocryphal Psalm 151, all in the all in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they were all found in Hebrew. I hope you can clearly see how the argument that the apocrypha was not written in Hebrew cannot be used. Hello, this is Anaya. This particular video is defending the apocrypha and pseudepigrapha against the, the God would not allow it claim. A Protestant will put the argument something like this. God is powerful enough to make sure that his people get all of scripture. He would not have allowed for any book of scripture to have been lost or hidden from his people. Okay, so that's the argument we are dealing with here. Now let me pose you a question to you. Let's say a person associated with Christianity became convinced that Christianity was corrupted. And let's say that person decided to create a religion called Islam. Now in Islam, the entire Protestant canon all 66 books are excluded. Many centuries later, we have devout followers of Islam. But what about the Protestant canon? They don't have it. So why did God allow for the Muslims to lose and make hidden the scriptures? And couldn't God be powerful enough to get all of his word to every single person on this earth? The answer to this question is that God gave us free will. And so people decided to listen to false teachings, and they rejected the 66 books of the Bible. The same can be said of true believers. False teachings can enter into the true faith and corrupt it. And I allege this is what happened. So, because people have free will, they will either choose to accept or reject certain parts of his word, and God will honor their choices by allowing the consequences of those choices to play out. There are some Christians today who reject the writings of Paul. Just because they don't accept them, does that mean the writings of Paul are not scripture? No. Some say we should only accept the books that are universally considered scripture. But that would mean that five of the New Testament books, 2 Peter, 2 John, 3 John, or excuse me, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and Revelation of John would all be excluded because not all Christians consider those five books to be considered scripture. Many Syrian Christians reject those five books even to this very day. Martin Luther, the Protestant father, rejected the book of Esther, the epistle of James, and even the epistle of Hebrews, all of which are found in the Protestant canon. Early Christians rejected seven of the New Testament books, the ones I just mentioned. As a Protestant, are you willing to follow through and reject at least eight books of the canon because, Christ because other Christians reject those books? Let's ask the question of why scripture is important, and what are the consequences of rejecting scripture? In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 through 17 we read, 
All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. When we reject books of scripture on the premise of being safe, we make ourselves more vulnerable to false teaching. With all of God's word, it would be much easier to refute false teachings and heresies. The spirit of compromise is from the devil. Should we compromise with those who use false teachings? No. In the same way, we should not compromise with people who say a certain book is or is not scripture, because in so doing, we are inviting heresy and false teaching into the truth, into the church, or excuse me, into the truth. And by compromising, we are putting obstacles to finding truth. At any rate, let me get back to the main argument. With all this information I just provided you, let me ask you, whose Bible is the true and real Bible? Do the Protestants have the true Bible? What about the Roman Catholics, or even the Orthodox Christians? So, what if the Bi Roman Catholic Bible is right and the Protestants are wrong about the Apocrypha? In the same way, the Muslims can reject the 66 books of the Protestant Bible, the same way Protestants can reject the books of the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha. You have been given free will, and you can choose to accept or reject these books. God does what he can to allow us to choose him, but he also allows us to reject what he has done by refusing to accept him. In the early days of the church history, many true believers did not even have access to the scriptures. For many years, people did not have access to the scriptures in the Roman Catholic Church because they could not speak Latin. God clearly allows scripture to be hidden from his people and even lost from us. In the scriptures, we read in the second book of Kings, chapters 22 to 23, and the second book of Chronicles, chapters 34 to 35, how King Josiah found the book of law and restored it to the people. The word found suggests that the book of law had been lost. The book of law is the five books of Moses, which are considered scripture among Protestants. So if King Josiah found the book of law, that means the book of law had been lost. These two books that testify to this are in the Protestant canon, so even the Protestant Bible teaches that scripture can be lost. I hope I have been able to show you how the argument that God would not have allowed us to lose his word falls apart. I could similarly, similarly argue that God would have not allowed for Catholics or anyone else to corrupt his word by adding books to it, but this is clearly not the case. In conclusion, I will ask you this question. What makes the Protestant Bible? Hello, this is Anaya. This video is in response to the Protestant claim that the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha are not scripture because they are not quoted in the New Testament. I will demonstrate that this argument is very weak. First of all, let me stress that there is a difference between quotations and references or allusions. Often the Protestants will say that the New Testament quotes from every Old Testament book except for Esther, but they are using a double standard here. They want us to accept the definition of quotation to be explicit verbatim citation in the case of the New Testament quoting the Apocrypha. However, they want us to accept a broader definition of quotation to include vague references or even specific references, but only in the case of the New Testament quoting the Old Testament books. But I am here to set things straight. Let us be consistent. Let us understand the word quotation to mean the explicit verbatim citation in both the case of the New Testament quoting the Apocrypha and the case of the New Testament quoting the Old Testament books. So, how many of the Old Testament books are quoted in the Bible? Out of the 39 books of the Protestant Old Testament, only 22 of them are quoted. The books of the Old Testament that are not quoted in the New Testament are Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 2 Samuel, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Obadiah, Jonah, Nahum, and Zephaniah. And in addition to the 22 books that are quoted, three books of the Pseudepigrapha are quoted in the New Testament. The Apocalypse of Elijah is being quoted in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. The Epistle of Paul to the Laodiceans is being quoted in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. And the book of Enoch is being quoted in Jude chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. So you will need another argument to reject those three books.
Are you willing to reject 17 Old Testament books because of this criteria, or should you refine what your argument is? It is very likely that the New Testament refers many times to the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha, just like it does to most of the 17 books that are not quoted. So don't be so quick to say that the Apocrypha is not referenced in Scripture, because if you follow that argument to its fullest conclusion, that would also mean that you would still have to reject some of the 17 books of the Old Testament, including the book of Esther and the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. There may be a few other books you would have to reject too from the Old Testament, but I have not exhaustively looked at all the references. I've only looked at the quotations. Now, let's take a look at some of these books of the Apocrypha. Baruch and the Epistle of Jeremiah are both Apocrypha books that were considered by many church fathers to be originally part of the book of Jeremiah, and the book of Jeremiah was quoted and referenced in the New Testament. Likewise, the same with the Apocryphal Susanna, Apocryphal Song of the Three Holy Men, and the Apocryphal Bell and the Dragon, originally being part of the, the book of Daniel, and the Apocryphal Additions to Esther, originally being a part of the book of Esther. The book of Esther is not quoted or referenced in the New Testament, so it would follow that the additions to Esther would not be quoted or referenced either. The Apocryphal Psalm 151 would be part of the book of Psalms and the New Testament certainly does not quote or refer to every psalm in the book of Psalms. So rejecting Psalm 151, because it is not quoted or referenced in the New Testament, would mean we would also have to reject a large majority of the psalms, if we were to be consistent. As we discussed before, the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah were not quoted or referenced in the New Testament. Since 1st Esdras and 2nd Esdras, both apocryphal books, purport to be written by Ezra, it would follow that if Ezra was not being quoted or referred to in the New Testament, neither would 1st Ezra or 2nd Ezra be referred to or quoted. So, so far, the fact that the Apocrypha is, isn't quoted from does nothing to suggest that they should not be included. But let's continue. One small chapter called the Prayer of Manasseh is an apocryphal book. While this passage is not quoted or referred to in the New Testament, it is quoted in the second book of Chronicles and most scholars acknowledge that, this, that the two books of Chronicles were originally one book. That means that since the New Testament quotes from the book of Chronicles, it is quoting a book that quotes the Apocryphal Prayer of Manasseh, thereby making the New Testament quoting the Apocryphal Prayer of Manasseh indirectly. After this comes the last five books of the Apocrypha. The book of Tobit has a very clear, strong, and direct reference in the New Testament. In fact, this reference is so important that it is included three times in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 22 verses 23 to 33, Mark chapter 12 verses 18 to 27, and Luke chapter 20 verses 27 to 40. All three of these passages refer to the book of Tobit. For in the book of Tobit, Sarah has seven husbands who all die childless. This is the same thing that happens in these in these passages from scripture uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Sadducees are clearly referencing the account of the book of Tobit in these passages. So what about the last four apocryphal books? All I can say is that the, New that the New Testament may reference them, but they may not. And just like the fact that the, New that the New Testament does not reference three books of the Old Testament, and those three books still being considered scripture, there was no problem for the same to be thought of concerning the four apocryphal books that may or may not be referred to in the New Testament, at least on the sole argument that they are not quoted or referenced. Hello, this is Anaya. I am making this video to establish what the criteria of scripture should be. I believe that the following criteria is essential for a book to be, to be scripture because we have been given rational and reasoning minds to search for and find the truth, and it would be foolish to accept anything on blind faith. In order for a book to be considered scripture, it must have the following. It must be a book that presents itself as having authority. The book cannot be illogical or irrational. It must be a book that does not contradict the truth. It must be a book that does not contradict other confirmed scriptures. It must be a book that has religious relevance. It must be a book that does not advocate immoral or false teachings. It must be useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It must be a book that is consistent and fully contained within one religion. What I mean by this is that scripture from one religion can't be considered scripture from another religion when the two religions have different gods. This significantly narrows down what books are scripture. For example, 
The following religions are all contradictory and distinct from each other. Judea Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Egyptian religion, Etruscan, Islam, Jainism, New Age religion, Greek mythology, Satanism, Scientology, Shintoism, Sikhism, Spiritism, Taoism, Thelema, Zoroastrianism, and ancient mythological religions. These are the only religions that have scriptures. Since they all contradict each other, and only one of them can be right, this significantly narrows down what scripture is. Uh, I just want to clarify that when I say said that the above are the only religions that have scriptures, you may have noticed that some religions seem to be omitted, like for instance Christianity. However, I'm including Christianity, Gnosticism, Mormonism in within Judaism because they all accept the core text of the Jewish version of God. So, just wanted to clarify that. Anyway, uh, it can now only be confined to one of these religions. The book must belong to the religion that has the best explanation of all the evidence. The book must have credibility. The book must be perfect. There must be a good and noble purpose for why the book was written. And it must contribute to the goal of the religion. It is my contention that Nazarene Judaism which believes that the Jewish Messiah is Yahushua and is Elohim, is the truth, and that all other religious groups are inferior to Nazarene Judaism. I believe more than 150 books are scripture, as opposed to the 66 books that Protestants consider scripture, and that the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha meet the criteria for scripture that I have outlined in this video. If you think this criteria is flawed in any way, post a comment below. Thank you and hello. This is Anayath. I am making this video as an introduction to my defense of the books of the Antilegomena. The term Antilegomena means books of the New Testament that were disputed by Christians as to whether or not they were scripture. The Antilegomena is described by the church father Eusebius as containing the following books. The Epistle of Hebrews, the Epistle of James, the Epistle of Jude, Second Epistle of Peter, Second Epistle of John, Third Epistle of John, the Acts of Paul, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Revelation of Peter, the Epistle of Barnabas, Didache, the Revelation of John, and the Gospel of the Hebrews. Something I wish to emphasize is that the Epistle of the Hebrews, the Epistle of James, the Epistle of Jude, the Second Epistle of Peter, the Second Epistle of John, the Third Epistle of John, and the Revelation of John are all considered scripture by Protestants and Roman Catholics, while the rest of the books that I mentioned as being part of the Antilegomena are rejected by most believers. A main point in regards to these texts of the Antilegomena is that the best explanation behind these writings is that they are authentic. No other explanation explains them and fits the evidence better. Hello, this is Anaya. I am making this video to demonstrate why I believe the Epistle of the Hebrews should be considered scripture. Some doubted this book because evidence suggests it was not written by Paul. Well, I don't know about you, but I know of no justification behind the idea that every book in the New Testament has to have been written by Paul. In fact, many books in the New Testament are not written by Paul. This is acknowledged by people who doubt the Epistle of the Hebrews. So even though Epistle of the Hebrews is not written by Paul, it doesn't matter. Some say it was written by Barnabas. This is testified by the church father Tertullian. Barnabas was considered an apostle, and the idea of scripture in New Testament times and the idea of scripture in New Testament times is that apostolic works were to be considered scripture. In other words, if an apostle wrote a religious book that met the criteria for scripture, it was to be considered scripture. The church father, Clement of Rome, references the epistle of Hebrews in his epistles. Considering when Clement of Rome lived, he would have witnessed where the epistle of the Hebrews came from, and the fact that he uses it indicates its authority among the early believers. He would not use the epistle of the Hebrews in the way he did if he did not expect his readers to accept the epistle of the Hebrews as authoritative.
The Shepherd of Hermas also considers the Epistle of Hebrews as scripture. The following church fathers, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, and Origen of Alexandria, all accepted the Epistle of Hebrews as apostolic. Included as scripture, it was also included as scripture in every codex found. The Epistle of Hebrews discusses intimate details of temple practice and customs. This is not written by someone of low status. This epistle bears great overwhelming evidence of someone who is intimately associated with the Jewish temple and customs, and the intimate aspects of the Levitical priesthood. Seeing as how Barnabas the Apostle was a Levite, this certainly fits with the data. There is no motivation for a writer to have forged this epistle, and further evidence suggests that this could have not been written after the year 70 CE because if the Jewish temple had been destroyed, the author, author would have certainly referenced the temple, for the destruction of the temple would have significantly helped the author of the epistle to the Hebrews to convince the people he was writing to of the message that he was conveying throughout the epistle, that the proper perspective of Jews should be filtered through the supremacy of the Messiah, and not empty physical Jewish things that of their own accord own accord have no meaning, but only have meaning when understood through the spirit of righteousness. The author of the epistle of Hebrews writes with authority, and he clearly portrays himself as authority over the true believers. It is to be concluded that Barnabas the apostle wrote the epistle of the Hebrews, and that the epistle of the Hebrews is scripture. Hello, this is Anaya, and I am making this video in order to demonstrate why I believe the Epistle of Barnabas should be considered scripture. The Epistle of Barnabas is doubted for, by some for several reasons. First of all, it quotes apocryphal books. This argument means nothing when we realize that the apocryphal books are scriptural. Further, the New Testament quotes apocryphal books, especially the Epistle of Jude. Thus, to reject the Epistle of Barnabas on the grounds that it quotes apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books would mean you would have to reject the Epistle of Jude as well, which clearly quotes from the pseudepigraphal Book of Enoch. Many argue that the Epistle of Barnabas was not written by the Apostle Barnabas because of its late date. However, the way they date this epistle is very weak. They date it almost exclusively on the fact that it quotes the apocryphal Second Esdras as scripture. And skeptics believe, without good evidence at all, that 2nd Esdras was written near the end of the 1st century CE. So that, that would mean that if that's true, then the Epistle of Barnabas, which quotes 2nd Esdras, could not have been written earlier than the 2nd century. But there is a huge and significant problem with, that, with this idea. First of all, the belief that 2nd Esdras is dated so late is based on the idea that it could not have possibly been authentic prophecy. Thus, if 2nd Esdras claims to prophesy about an event, skeptics will say it must have been written after the event happened. However, if you believe in the gift of prophecy, as all believers do, then you should realize that this is a really poor argument. What is really going on here is a bias against apocryphal books and against Judaism and Christianity in general. Skeptics have yet to demonstrate how the Epistle of Barnabas could have been fooled by 2nd Esdras. If it had just been recently created, the author would not have so quickly quoted the book, for he would have known that no one regarded 2nd Esdras as the actual words of Esdras, thereby discrediting the entire book, and that would have not suited, suited the purposes at all of the author of the Epistle of Barnabas. There is evidence that the Epistle of Barnabas could not have been written after the year 132. 132 CE due to the content of the epistle describing events that happened after the destruction of the temple in 70 CE and before the Bar Kokhba revolt of 132 CE. The epistle of Barnabas was included in the Codex Sinaiticus, an early and major authority for the manuscripts of the New Testament, even according to Protestants. The Codex Hierosolimitanus, a much later version of the Bible, included the Epistle of Barnabas, among many other books not currently in the Protestant New Testament.
the church fathers Clement of Alexandria and Origen of Alexandria both considered the Epistle of Barnabas to be scripture. By those who consider it scripture and those that reject the Epistle of Barnabas, the Epistle of Barnabas could not have been written any earlier than 70 CE. This makes Clement of Alexandria a valuable witness to the Epistle of Barnabas, for he is only distanced by about 100 years. Further, evidence that the Apostle Barnabas wrote the Epistle of Barnabas is that there are many clear and direct parallels with the Epistle of Hebrews and the Epistle of Barnabas. Both authors talk about similar things, and both advocate a shift in the perspective on Jewish beliefs, customs, and traditions. A final argument that claims that the Epistle of Barnabas is not scripture is that the Epistle of Barnabas is extremely anti-Jewish. At first glance, most would be convinced that the Epistle of Barnabas is anti-Jewish. However, this is mainly on the, on the bias of the translators, and as such, if you look at the Epistle of Barnabas without the bias of the translators, you will see that the Epistle of Barnabas is not anti-Jewish at all. In fact, it is one of the most Jewish books of scripture in the entire New Testament. Barnabas is not claiming that Jews are wrong to observe the law of Moses, such as the Sabbath, abstaining from unclean meats, and circumcision. Rather, Barnabas is stressing that if these things are done outside of the spiritual meaning of them, they lose all of their meaning. Circumcision of the flesh means nothing if your heart is not circumcised. Likewise, the prohibition of unclean meats becomes an empty ritual when the prohibition is void of spiritual discipline and understanding. And the Sabbath was constantly being corrupted by some Jews who did not understand the meaning and purpose of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was not supposed to be a burden for the people. It was supposed to be a delight and, a, and joy. But they lost the meaning of it when they removed the spiritual aspects of the law and replaced and made supreme the physical aspects of the rituals. As the arguments disappear one by one, it is clear then that, the, that Barnabas was the author of the Epistle of Barnabas. Hello, this is Anaya. I am making this video in order to demonstrate why I believe that the Epistle of Jude should be considered scripture. The Epistle of Jude was considered scripture by the Church Father Clement of Alexandria and the Church Father Tertullian, the Murator Muratorian Canon, and it was included in the Codex Sinaiticus and the majority of other extant versions of scripture. The second epistle of Peter quotes the book of Jude, intending to convey to its intended, intended audience that the epistle of Jude is authentic and represents the teachings of the apostles. The Muratorian ca Canon is dated by scholars to have been around the year 170 CE. This means that the Epistle of Jude had to have been written early enough so that those who were a part of the Muratorian canon could have confirmed whether or not Jude was part of the authentic tradition of the Apostles. Evidence in support of this is that the Shepherd of Hermas is cited as being of a recent production in the time of the Muratorian canon, and they did not consider it to be apostolic because of this. It would seem they attempted, attempted to use consistent reasoning and logic to determine whether or not a book was written by an apostle. It seems that they emphasized a very high criteria and standard for what they considered apostolic because they rejected from the anti-legomena the Epistle of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Acts of Paul, the Epistle of James, the Second Epistle of Peter, and the Third Epistle of John as Scripture. So while those books may or may not be Scripture, it seems very clear that the Epistle of Jude has a reliable testimony, and that its acceptance in the Muratorian canon indicates its origin was well established as being written by Jude the Apostle, and thus making it Scripture, as it was apostolic and authoritative. It is clear, clear that the main source of doubt concerning the Epistle of Jude is that it quotes and references apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books, often referring to them as authoritative, and especially the Book of Enoch, referring to it as authentic prophecy. But had the people who have made those arguments ever stopped and wondered if perhaps they are wrong about the apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books, and perhaps 
that those apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books should be considered scripture, just as Jude considers them scripture? Jude's reliance on apocrypha and pseudepigrapha indicates that the early believers considered the apocrypha and pseudepigrapha to be authentic. Jude's epistle is written in order to fight against heresy and false teaching, and he advocates the use of these extra books to teach against the false teachers, implying that these books have the authority as scripture to effectively rebuke the false teaching. Jude is the author of this epistle. Hello, this is Anaya. I am making this video to demonstrate why I believe that the second epistle of Peter should be considered scripture. The second epistle of Peter is included in the Codex Sinaiticus version as scripture, as well as the majority of other versions of the Bible. The Codex Sinaiticus is dated to the early 4th century, and thus, it is evident that the second epistle of Peter must have been written before the 4th century, otherwise people would not have believed that it was scripture. Origen of Alexandria discusses the second epistle of Peter and believes it to be scripture, and thus the date for the second epistle of Peter is pushed back farther. With the information that Origen accepted it as scripture, it can be confidently maintained that the second epistle of Peter was written before the third century. It is also possible that Polycarp alludes to the second epistle of Peter, but this is at best a vague allusion. The second epistle of Peter quotes extensively from the book of Jude, from the epistle of Jude. It is clear that the author of the second epistle of Peter considers himself to be an authority. Furthermore, the revelation of Peter bears striking resemblance, resemblances to the second epistle of Peter, and since evidence strongly suggests Peter was the author of the revelation of Peter, thus making it scripture, the relationship between the voice, style, and tone of sec the second epistle of Peter seem to be too similar to the revelation of Peter to be mere coincidence. Both the revelation of Peter and the second epistle of Peter most likely came from the same source, and since the revelation of Peter can be confidently understood to be scripture, so can also the second P epistle of Peter be considered scripture. Hello, this is Anaya. I am making this video in order to demonstrate why I believe the revelation of Peter should be considered scripture. The revelation of Peter is rejected by skeptics once again because of their anti-apocryphal bias. They date the book of 2nd Exodus to the end of the 1st century CE, and as mentioned in my previous video about the Epistle of Barnabas, the dating of 2nd Exodus is severely flawed and suggests that the revelation of Peter used a book as authoritative even though the author knew that the book was only recently created. This is a very weak argument, and if 2nd Edris had been only written, recently written around the time of the early 2nd century, they surely would not have quoted it, let alone regarded it as an authentic source in scriptural authority. The Muratorian canon included the revelation of Peter as scripture, and it is that is significant because they didn't just accept any book of scripture. They only accepted, accepted books that were well established and that their apostolic authority could be clearly demonstrated. The Shepherd of Hermas was rejected by the Muratorian canon on the grounds that it was not written by an apostle. These people who were behind the Muratorian canon were convinced that the books they acknowledged as scripture were indeed scripture and written by the apostles. The main argument against the Apocalypse of Peter being scripture among the early believers was really that it was too graphic and too disturbing. Even this fact didn't prevent it from being maintained as authoritative, apostolic, and scripture, though in time, the disturbing nature of the book was ultimately what led it to being not included in later versions of the Bible. It was considered scripture by the Church Father Theophilus of the year 180 CE and the Church Father Clement of Alexandria. The Revelation of Peter is clearly written by the Apostle Peter and should be considered scripture. Hello, this is Anaya. I am making this video in order to demonstrate why I believe that the Revelation of John should be considered scripture. The Revelation of John is included as scripture in the Codex Sinaiticus version of the Bible, as well as the majority of other versions of the Bible. The Revelation of John may be perhaps the easiest book of all the anti-legomena to accept as scripture. It is stated to have been written by the Apostle John around the 
the year 95 CE. A church father, Polycarp, was his direct successor, and the church father, Justin Martyr, was born roughly right around the time John died, in 100 CE. It is in this case that we see that it would be very easy to establish the origin of the revelation of John by appealing to Polycarp, and by just the short length of time between the testimony of Justin and the origin of this writing. There simply had not been enough time to write this off as a forger forgery. If the book had not been written by the Apostle John, certainly a mere 25 years later they would not have been so naive to have been fooled into believing the revelation of John was real when it wasn't. Rather, the better and more honest explanation is that there is just no logical way that the revelation of John could not have been written by John, for they the people of that time knew John too well, and would have certainly identified the fake immediately. The Shepherd of Hermas considers the revelation of John as scripture. Irenaeus also testifies that it was universally acknowledged at his time that it was indeed written by the Apostle John and thus considered scripture. Theophilus of Antioch accepted it as scripture in 180 CE. It was also included in the Muratorian Canon dated roughly to 170 CE. As I have already discussed, its inclusion in the Muratorian canon is significant considering the high standard they had for what constituted scripture. Clement of Alexandria and Origen of Alexandria both accept, accepted it as scripture. Methodius of Olympus, Cyprian, and, Lank Lantain, excuse me, and Lanctantius consider it scripture as well. For the first two centuries, it was universally agreed upon that the revelation of John was apostolic in scripture. However, false teachings entered the church starting around this time, and shortly after, the teaching against the literal millennium grew ground, and as this became more and more the belief of the church, the revelation of John grew more and more into disuse. However, it survived the heresy and continued to remain scripture in the eyes of believers up until this very day. Further evidence that the revelation of John is authentic scripture is due to the prophecy that it contains. One such significant and major prophecy was how John prophesied about the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon, described in the revelation of John, and this was written well before the creation of the Roman Catholic Church. The revelation of John has nothing against its authenticity and everything for it. Hello, this is Anaya. I am making this video in order to demonstrate why I believe that the second epistle of John and the third epistle of John should both be considered scripture. The second epistle of John is considered scripture according to the Muratorian canon and included in the Codex Sinaiticus and the majority of other versions of the Bible as scripture. The church father, Irenaeus, considered the second epistle of John as scripture. It is referenced by Polycarp and, it, and is considered scripture by Clement of Alexandria. The third epistle of John is not included as scripture in the Muratorian canon, however. Anth however, Athanasius of Alexandria considered this in the second epistle of John as scripture written by the apostle John. Further, the third epistle of John also is included in the Codex Sinaiticus and the majority of other versions of the Bible as scripture. It is referenced by Or Origen, and it may be referenced by Polycarp, but this reference isn't clear if it is from the third epistle of John or not. There does not seem to be any motivation imaginable as to why someone would forge the epistle, the third epistle of John. The best argument suggests the third epistle of John is authentic and was written by the apostle John. The style is overwhelmingly consistent with his other writings, especially his second epistle, which above has already been established as scripture. Thus, there seems to be no good argument to explain the existence of this epistle other than the fact that it was written by the Apostle John. Up until the last two centuries, the official position of Syrian Christianity was that the five books of the New Testament being the second epistle of Peter, second epistle of John, the third epistle of John, epistle of Jude, and the revelation of John were not to be included in Bibles and scripture. This was done because those books did not have extant copies of those books in their preferred language, because they believed that in order for a book to be considered scripture, it must have been written in their preferred language. However, this is a weak argument, and we know that the language which the Syrians required it to be written in 
was not representative of the original languages those and the other New Testament books were written in. Thus, while 3 John is arguably the book of the Protestant Bible that has the weakest evidence, there is enough evidence to be convinced that both the 2nd Epistle of John and the 3rd Epistle of John can be read confidently and without a doubt as scripture. Hello, this is Anaya. I am making this video in order to demonstrate why I believe that the Acts of Paul should be considered scripture. The main argument against the Acts of Paul being considered scripture is that the Church Father Tertullian condemns the Acts of Paul. The theory goes that all four parts of the Acts of Paul that were circulated as separate texts were originally a part of the Acts of Paul and written by this presbyter who admitted to writing the book. However, I do not see this as strong evidence that the presbyter Tertullian is referencing in the sec early 2nd century wrote the entire Acts of Paul on his own. In fact, I actually believe that the, be the evidence best fits in which the presbyter incorporated the four separate texts into one composite text, then added his own details and also made his own edits. The fact that the presbyter admits that he published the Acts of Paul does not mean that he was being deceptive, or even that the additional details he added were not authoritative. All it means is that the parts of the Acts of Paul he did write, he wrote in honor, in order to honor the Apostle Paul. There is no shame or deception in that. Tertullian cites that this book was being used by believers to support the belief that women were allowed to teach and to baptize. It is out of this bias in which Tertullian is motivated to discredit the Acts of Paul that the main argument against the Acts of Paul comes from. Rather, it seems likely that the author of the Acts of Paul combined books that he knew were written by authentic authorities. If his desire was to honor Paul, he would only want to use the most authentic writings available, and he would only want historically based and trustworthy accounts. In the majority of churches, there is the tradition of Saint Thecla. But where does this tradition come from? Do we really think that the churches would accept the account of the Acts of Thecla, which is included in the Acts of Paul, if it was written and proven to be a fictitious and pseudepigraphal account? I think that would be a long shot. People are not as stupid as modern day people make them out to be. If anyone is naive, it is the modern man and not the early believers for the early believers had access to all the evidence out there as to whether certain books were trustworthy or not. The Acts of Paul was considered scripture in Bodmer pa Papyri 10, the Syrian Christian Aphoret in the first half of the first, uh, excuse me, in the first half of the fourth century, he was a writer, he considered it to be scripture, uh, the doctrine of Adai considered it scripture, it was considered scripture in the Armenian Orthodox Church for more than 1,000 years. The most recent Bible version that included the Acts of Paul as scripture was the Oscan Armenian Bible of the year 1666 CE. It was also included as an appendix in the Zorab Armenian Bible in the year 1805 CE. For reasons unknown, the Acts of Paul ceased to exist as part of the New Testament according to the Armenian Orthodox Church. It is probable that the reason for this occurred sometime in between the Oskin Armenian Bible, which included it as scripture, and the Zorab Armenian Bible, which included it only in an appendix. With all this taken into consideration, I believe the evidence is overwhelming in the authority and apostolic nature of the Acts of Paul. Hello, this is Anaya, and I am making this video in order to demonstrate that the Didache should be considered scripture. Didache was included as scripture in the version of the Bible known as Codex Hierosolimitanus in the year 1056. The Apostolic Constitutions incorporates the book of Didache, thus demonstrating that the compiler of the Apostolic Constitutions believes the Didache to be scripture and authoritative. The Apostolic Constitutions is dated to the 4th century, thus making the origin of Didache no later than the 4th century. Eusebius references it as part of the Anti-Legomena, 
and thus Didache must have been written earlier than the 4th century. The Epistle of Barnabas quotes the Didache. The account of the two ways are both contained in them, and the evidence seems to suggest much more likely that Barnabas uses Didache rather than Didache using Barnabas. Using the Epistle of Barnabas would not serve the Didache's purpose. The Didache tries to present itself as the teachings of all the apostles, and thus the Epistle of Barnabas would not be quoted from, because that would discredit the apostolic authority of the Didache, something that was the main objective of the Didache to, contain, to obtain. There is also evidence that the shep shepherd of Hermas, Irenaeus, Origen of, and Al Origen of Alexandria, referenced the Didache, though this is not universally acknowledged. Clement of Alexandria certainly considered the Didache to be scripture. One last objection is that the Didache teaches against the law of Moses. This is not true. Once again, it is an issue of translator bias. If you remove this bias, you can clearly see that it is an authentic Jewish writing that does not teach that the law of Moses is abolished. In conclusion, the Didache has enough evidence to be trusted as epistolic in a book of scripture. Hello, this is Anaya. I am making this video in order to demonstrate why I believe the Shepherd of Hermas should be considered scripture. It is included as scripture in the Codex Sinaiticus version of the Bible. The Church Fathers, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, and Origen of Alexandria all consider the Shepherd of Hermas as scripture. The Shepherd of Hermas was not regarded apostolic according to the people behind the Muratorian canon. However, Origen considered the author to be the Hermas mentioned in Paul's epistle to the Romans. The Apostle John lived nearly a hundred years old. It is certainly possible that Hermas lived just as long. In this way, according to the Muratorian canon, the Shepherd of Hermas could retain its recent production as cited and testified by the Muratorian canon. And the book can also be apostolic because Hermas probably wrote the book near the end of his life, thus reconciling the two apparent discrepancies of the descriptions among the church. In the Shepherd of Hermas, it refers to Clement of Rome. Thus, it must be written during or after the ministry of Clement. The last objection is that the Shepherd of Hermas advocates the heresy known as ad adoptionism. However, the language is vague enough to be understood and interpreted in a more orthodox and true way. The fact that it does not claim to be written by any of the more famous apostles indicates that the author considered himself to have apostolic authority of his own right, and the extremely widespread usage and acceptance of the Shepherd of Hermas in the early church period testifies to its apostolic authority and origin, and that it is indeed script scripture. Hello, this is Anaya. This is the last of my videos on the series of anti-Legomena and why I believe they are scripture. I am making this last video in order to demonstrate why I believe that the Gospel of the Hebrews should be considered scripture. The Gospel of the Hebrews is the book that has the most evidence among the anti-Legomena that it is an authentic book of scripture and apostolic in nature. It is acknowledged among the majority of scholars that it is the most likely explanation for the synoptic, synoptic problem. The Church Fathers Jerome, Epiphanius of Salamis, Eusebius, Origen of Alexandria, Clement of Alexandria, Irenaeus, Hegesippus, and Papias all refer to the Gospel of the Hebrews. And with the exception of the first three, all the rest consider it to be scripture, authentic, authoritative, and apostolic in nature. Papias quoted the Gospel of the Hebrews in the early 2nd century. The Gospel of Hebrews was universally acknowledged as a book of scripture written by the Apostle Matthew for the first few centuries. It is a lost book of scripture. However, it was a significant enough book in the early church that almost all of the book is preserved in quotations and references from church fathers and other secondary religious sources. The Gospel of the Hebrews clearly offers the best explanation for all the other Gospels overwhelming number of similarities in the consensus of the church fathers that the original gospel was the church of the hebrew what was the gospel of the hebrews written by the apostle matthew thus making it a book of scripture thank you for joining me in these series of videos these 
13 videos about the anti-legomena. I hope you've enjoyed them, and uh, feel free to comment on them, and you can tell me if you think some of my arguments were flawed, and uh, I will be happy to reason and debate with you about that. Uh, thank you very much again for watching these videos and taking your time, and I hope that at the end, by the end of this that you have at least considered the possibility that the entire anti-legomena is scripture. Hello, this is Anaya. In honor of Purim, I have decided to make this video in order to demonstrate why I believe the book of Esther should be considered scripture. The most common objection to this book's authenticity is that the book does not mention God at all. Therefore, it should not be considered scripture. Now, this is a good argument, except for the fact that the book of Esther does mention God, and consistently. In the original version, that is. Many people view the Greek editions to be just that, additions to the original text. But I argue contrary to that. The Greek editions were actually part of the original version, and it is the Hebrew version that has omissions. The testimony of Josephus, also quoted and considered authentic facts about Esther that can only be found in the additions to Esther. If Josephus, the great historian, regarded authentic the Greek editions, it makes it much more likely that the Greek editions are authentic. Another piece of evidence that demonstrates that the book of Esther is scripture is the widespread and authoritative status of the Feast of Purim, which was passed down from generation to generation. How else could this feast have originated other than having actually originated how the book of Esther claims it does. Such a deception and conspiracy would not be able to be pulled off. It would have been immediately discredited. The Jews didn't just accept anything as authentic. They wanted proof and evidence of it. The Orthodox Jews revealed the Orthodox Jews reveal that they regard the additions to Esther as authentic. One final piece of evidence regarding historical corroboration, and thus authenticity, is that the two Persian deities, Ishtar and Marduk, who were cousins. Ishtar sounds very similar to Esther, and Marduk sounds very similar to Mordecai, and Esther was the cousin of Mordecai. In Persian documents around the time period Esther is supposed to have taken place, there are records of officials whose names are Mardica. Thus, putting all this evidence together, I believe we can confidently regard the book of Esther as scripture, and that the additions to Esther are indeed authentic, as demonstrated by Josephus' tradition and the fact that they actually teach about God, as opposed to the Masoretic version of Esther.